is land garbage. Sure, let's come. Well, I'd like to welcome you all here to the Dickinson County Historical Society and Museum this evening. This is our first go at a new speaker series we've begun this year called History Lives. Um, so again, we welcome you here. Um, if you have any issues with seeing tonight, feel free to get up and move your chair or stand or whatever you need to do. Um, we're a little crunched in this facility. As you can tell, we had to move a lot of stuff out to make room. But um, we're happy to do that. Um, I would like to introduce to you, if he would come up yeah. here, this is my friend John Smelter, who has become very interested in Fred Gilbert and all things concerning Fred Gilbert. Um, he has many reasons for being interested in Fred Gilbert. One is that the land that Fred shot on, on the south shore of Spirit, Big Spirit Lake, he calls home these days. He's also a competitive track shooter, like Fred Gilbert, and also, now this is a real trivia question if you ever need one, John's last name is Smelzer. Fred Gilbert won the Smelzer Cup at one time, and we think that there is a familial connection there between them. Um, what else would you like me to say, John? Thank you, Mary. It's been, it's been a pleasure getting to know you. It goes back actually about four years, but I didn't realize that I had already met Mary. And in the last several months, I came to realize that I had actually met Mary. And we've been working here together at the museum on Fred Gilbert basically since that day that I first really came to help with some cleanup here at the museum um, and went back to the Fred Gilbert display and Mary and I spoke of it and she said wait till I move all of this stuff out from the front of it then you can get close enough to see it and that prompted a discussion of taking a particular topic like Fred Gilbert and actually then putting some legs to it and doing a public presentation exposing the display for what it is, a, a very great historical tribute to someone who, from a community perspective, it was significant and one that needs to be remembered, and also using it as a way for us to explore ways to interact with the community better through the historical building. And, and with that in mind, you can see that you know, our audience is great, our space is limited, but that's okay. We're willing to accommodate. So that's what got us going. And then in the process of doing that, I was contacted, we were contacted, I think the museum was contacted and then it was deferred to me by a researcher who was interested for a completely different reason in the Fred Gilbert gun that was housed maybe at the library in Spear Lake, maybe at the Dickinson County Museum and Gary Gordon and his wonderful wife are back here today and today we're scheduled to have them come and actually do a hands-on inspection for the first time since 1976 when the gun was placed into the display of the shotgun that was used by Fred Gilbert and I'll let Gary give a little bit of a summary of where he feels he's at right now uh, later on in, in the program but we're pretty excited with not the conclusions, but with what we have observed so far with the inspection of this gun and also the cleaning of this gun um, so that it's preserved going forward in a much better state than it was as yesterday. So all of those things have kind of come together. Gary, thank you. Raise your hand just so folks, if they want to talk about uh, premium firearms, old and antique firearms, Gary has become, uh, after the rest of his career, uh, an emerging expert on that. And we may even go so far as to co-author an article together uh, in the Double Gun Journal. So with that, I'll move into the program about Fred Gilbert. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, John. 
So as you drive down the city uh, Hill Avenue going north, you all go by the, the Gilbert Park and you see the sign, we'll see it later in the presentation, that basically says, it, it, it says Gilbert Park, established 1874. And I always was curious about why that was 1874, knowing that Gilbert wasn't born until 1865, why would a nine-year-old have a park named after him? So, curiosity for one thing. In the exploration of the, the documents, I found a relationship that's very solid between Annie Oakley, the Annie Oakley of both Western fame, Buffalo Bill, as well as a peer shooter in the, the whole game of trap shooting and other types of competitive shooting with Fred Gilbert. And in a letter that she wrote just at the towards the end of her life, she wrote it to the daughter of Fred Gilbert, who was appropriately named Annie Oakley Gilbert. And in that letter, she wrote, in, in declaring pieces of her recollection of Annie Oakley Gilbert's father, who was still living at the time, but was close to the end of his life. She wrote, you know, he won without bragging and he lost without grumbling. And as you read through the documentation about Gilbert here locally, you find a, a, a humble person who grew up here in the community, much like we have, or many of us have, and then for reasons that probably only God would know, he was thrust into the limelight, the likes of which we'll see a little bit more. So Fred Gilbert, the subject of our topic tonight. This is the, this is the image that ha has haunted me for many, many years. My wife's family, both my wife Marsha over here and her sister Jolene, lived down this road and a half mile to the east. And we've driven by this road many, many times, and I've looked at maps about this location, and I've tried to understand it, and it, Gilbert always comes up as being a key piece of it. And it turns out that this was the Chautauqua Park in Spirit Lake, established in 1874, and Chautauquas were a real big thing in the late 1800s. And then as motor cars came on, this area was used as a motel for Spirit Lake for the motor cars that were coming into town in the 1910, 1912, 1915 period, and people camped, they auto-camped. This was the auto camping park, or at least one of them in town. In 1926, it was renamed in honor of Fred Gilbert. So the date somewhat misleads, and that's one of the things that I found in this exploration, was that in honor of Fred Gilbert's prowess and towards the end of his life, the city saw fit to go ahead and rename the park in his honor. As Mary talked about, my <coughs> wife has lived and had her family has lived on the South Shore of Big Spirit Lake since 1960 and literally has grown up on the shores in which Fred Gilbert and the Indian Shooters of Spirit Lake, a group that was an organized club, actually shot competitive trap from the shores just in front of the, the north side of the Orleans Hotel. And, and I always was intrigued and I've been down there walking those shorelines, picking up beach glass with my wife, and also on occasion find, finding the brass head of a shot shell that would have been used most likely, not guaranteed, but most likely during one of those events and lost out into the waves. Uh, and picking up pieces of shards, thinking maybe they might be clay birds. As Mary said, I also have been a competitive shooter on a small scale for a long time. Continue to do competitive shooting, but in kind of a funsy approach. I shoot single action, uh, I'm a member of the Single Action Shooting Society, and I go by the handle of Mongo, Colorado. <laughs> That's who I am. And I put a hat on, and I put a pair of big boots on, and I go out and I actually compete up in Jackson at Fort Belmont. We would shoot in the club known as the Fort Belmont Regulators, and a group of about 50 who get together at least once a month during the summertime and actually have competitions 
uh, from all ages, with all genders, to everybody gets to play. And then, obviously, the, the, Fred Schme the Schmelzer connection of the Schmelzer Cup out of Kansas City. The Schmelzer Company, the sporting goods store, was kind of the Cabela's of the late 1800s. And if you took a look at any of their literature, they had catalogs that were this thick. And they actually had everything from baseballs and did some of the very first baseball cards of the professional players, and some of them are the worth, worth the most uh, out there. And they, they kept in business until the early 1900s, uh, maybe even the, up to about the 20s, if, if I remember correctly. Next slide. So here's what started it all. This is the case. This is the gun. This is the way that the... Uh, the projection of the whole uh, uh, collection of Gilbert materials was at the time that I first started. And then Mary has now aggregated some things together. We've brought additional materials. And this is what it looked like. And it really represents the first event that brought Gilbert to fame, which was the 1895 live bird shoot, which was really unusual but still a thing back in the late 1800s in Baltimore, in which he went to Baltimore at the behest of friends with a loaned gun and as a 30-year-old, 29-year-old plus a few months, won the national champ, the world championship against all of the competitive shooters of the day. And I just pulled a, a goose clip and gave it to Gary today that shows a linkage between the firearm that he used and the firearm that we have in our possession in this case right now. Next slide. One of the things in talking to Gary early on that really intrigued us was the fact that this particular shotgun, if you can see kind of in the middle of the slide, has that small bird. This is an L.C. Smith pigeon grade shotgun. Okay, so big deal. Well, it turns out that that's what Gilbert used in the 1895 shoot. We know that it was donated to the museum with a backstory that said it was Gilbert's gun. <coughs> we know that there are stories out there that speak of one thing we found out today was the weight of the gun. This gun weighs eight pounds, two ounces. And it's reported that the 1895 tournament, the gun that was measured or weighed there, weighed eight pounds and it was an L.C. Smith. We don't know if it was a pigeon grade, but we make some assumptions. Next. One of the pieces that I really wanted to focus on, because people talk about Gilbert as just a shooter. That's who he was. He was a shooter. Well, Gilbert had parents. Gilbert had history here prior to the point at which he became Fred Gilbert, the trap shooter. Here what you see is a, an ancestry record for, from 1860 for his father, John P. Gilbert, 29, a millinery type. He's living with uh, a, a Brockshire and his wife down in Clay County, 1860, three years after the Spirit Lake Massacre. Okay? So he's in the area as the father, unwed, He's unwed, so he has no children. In 1860, next slide. 1870, we look at it, and we find John P. Gilbert, now married to Jeanette, <coughs> with Freddie, four years old, and his sister, who he loved dearly through his entire life at seven months. And then these other folks, George Taylor, Charles Taylor, Enoch Taylor, and then a farmhand. A lot of things going on there. We'll come back to them. Go to the next slide. What we found out in the process of trying to make these comparisons and is the, really the key thing is Ink, Ink Paduda knocked down Mr. E. Taylor, threw his son into the fireplace, badly burning his leg, and carried off his wife. Addie Mead and Mrs. Taylor were released after one night in the Indian camp of Ink Paduda, 1857, just before the massacre. Next slide. If you come back and look, E. Taylor, Enoch Taylor, this is the son, 
This is the son that most likely was thrown into the fire. Lord George, we don't know exactly at the moment. But Jeanette, now Gilbert, was Jeanette um, Brooks Taylor and, and was the wife that actually was just reported in that last one. And Enoch Taylor ended up being murdered shortly after the event with Ink Peduta and she remarried John P. Gilbert who was in Clay County, which is where all this was happening down at Gillette Road. Okay, next slide. So in looking for John P. Gilbert, trying to figure out more about that family and that portion of the family, I find a homesteading that occurred here locally. I always wanted to know where he lived. They always talked about him going over to East Lake, going over to East Lake, going over to East Lake, and they never said, where did he live? Well, that's where he lived. This is a document that actually documents the section and, and all signed by Ulysses S. Grant, or at least by a representative of Ulysses S. Grant that describes that location. I know you can't read it, let's go to the next one. This you can read more. He actually went to Sioux City, where he had a patented claim for the south half of the northeast quarter, of the southeast quarter, of the northwest quarter, of section two, I think it was, or section 14, range 36. Okay, well, what does that mean? Next slide. Looking at the 1883 map that we have here in the museum, taking pictures, if you look right in the middle, John P. Gilbert shows up. 159.50 acres. He's surrounded by the brown owls. We all know the brown owls as a very <coughs> substantial family here in the community. The brown owl building downtown, Mary and the Walk went to that. You see adjacent to him the B.B. Steinberg group, right over here to the wall on the right, some B.B. Steinberg, Steinberg stuff. Uh, and it was Steinberg's family that loaned the shotgun to Fred Gilbert as a young man to go to Baltimore to win that first tournament. Uh, and there's a, a lot of other things, but the location here is, is one we well know. This is the East Lake Road over at Arthur Heights, East Oaks Estate. My sister-in-law lives just a little north of this right on the lakeside. And it's a place we drive by every day, but nobody really ever talked about Fred Gilbert being a person who grew up right there. And if you know about that area, you know that now it's a very agricultural. Go to the next slide. This is kind of the physical depiction of it on the BLM map. Next slide. Here's, here's the Google map version of it showing what it looks like. Next slide. And here's what it looks like now agriculturally. From the east out towards the shooting range, if you know where the shooting range is at, this is the road. I'm at the, my back is east. And I'm looking to the west, over towards East Lake, across this basically 160 acres of corn. That's Fred Gilbert's home. Next slide. So, relationships were all important. Something that Steinberg and, and Brownell and others had, and as the story progresses a little bit, next slide. We'll we'll talk a bit about Gilbert and his relationships, but in this particular one found a, a new relationship piece that was of great interest. If you look right here, C.C. Smeltzer, T.W. Brockshank, John P. Gilbert, H.E.W. Smeltzer, side by side by side, on a listing of the 1861 Republican ticket for the presidency and Clay County, uh, County Supervisors. This was the ticket. Smeltzers were on it. Gilbert's were on it, and they were all so associated together. Not my family, just my surname. <laughs> Not very many of us around, but they happen to be tied here. And it just so happens that C.C. Smeltzer was the first county attorney in Clay County, and H.E.W. Smeltzer was the first teacher in Clay County. So, associations that were really important to me that all of a sudden just popped out of the woodwork. Next slide. So in this whole area, what you had is you had Spirit Lake being promoted in the early days, late 1800s, as kind of the wonderland of the Northern Plains. The railroad came here, and that was really key. And this is all railroad material. Next slide. 
a card as advertising for coming to the Spirit Lake area. On the other side of that card, you'll see in the next slide, was a, basically a ticket uh, advertising for them to, to buy tickets on the Burlington Northern. And of course, in this particular case, at the very top, you can see Hunter's Lodge doesn't even speak of Crandall's. You can see Minnesota, the northern portion of Spear Lake projected up into Minnesota, which of course it isn't, but the maps of that early era did. Next slide. And this actually was the Burlington Cedar Rapids and Northern advertising of the Orleans Hotel, which was at the end of that train track to get people to come to do all the wonderful things of fishing and hunting and exploring the, the Spirit Lake area. Next one. Steamberg was key, as was Brownell, because one of the things that happened, and we always wondered why, Fred Gilbert moved out of his family, apparently, at least the way it's described, and moved in with what would become his future father-in-law, mother-in-law, the John Klein family. It took a long time to sort it out, but I finally did it. Steenberg's living next, not living next door, but those land next door stores are their friends. They have the, the, the land, the 160 acres that belongs to John P. Gilbert. John P. Gilbert, unfortunately, in 1877 or thereabouts, has a very serious stroke and ends up being disabled to the point that he can't farm anymore. And he's forced to move off his farm and move into town. <coughs> his wife, of course, is still with him. And we find a record in the Spirit Lake Beacon of his wife actually suing other officials in town, other people in town, who had been unlawfully serving alcohol to her disabled hu uh, husband, sued them for $5,000. Now that was an amazingly angry lady. <laughs> because he's disabled, he has brain damage reports, and he's not able to walk well, and he can't work. And he lives on for 20 years, passing in 1897, even after his wife passed in 1892. Next slide. Steenberg was actually a part of this, and I wanted to show this slide, just basically that he was involved in hunting it as well. Next slide. So in 1892, um, Gilbert marries Maggie Klein, her parents John Klein and Sarah Freed. Um, he's, he's 20, I think 27 years old, yeah, 27 years old. First married for both, and they actually end up living on the rented farm for a period of time. Next slide. Fred lives to 1927. Mother lives to 92, father lives to 80 and 97, all buried out here at Lakeview Cemetery. And, and interestingly enough, another part of that haunted me for many years is I would drive, that, drive the back road behind the Lakeview Cemetery. I would drive along and I would actually see the Gilbert headstone. And I didn't know that it was Fred Gilbert. It just was Gilbert. And I had a family where I grew up that was Gilbert. And I always wondered where they Related. That was kind of the question that passed through my head, and then I went on. Well, I finally walked out and visited them and took these photos here not too long ago. And pretty much the whole family is right here in this cluster. His wife is actually also buried there. I don't know if she's right adjacent, but she's right there as well. Thanks for that. Marriage photo got from a family member and part of this communication. We've been in touch with a lot of folks that are part of the family. Um, in this case, it was Donna Short who provided this particular particular image, <clears throat> and Donna provided a bunch of other ones as well. Next slide. This is this is Fred Gilbert's mother. No, I'm sorry, Fred Gilbert's wife. This is Margaret Klein, and it was reported that at one point before her marriage, she had hair that was measured at ten feet. <laughs> And that after she was married, she had cut to six feet. And that she suffered serious headaches. <laughs> and we all go, oh, I wonder. But she, she obviously spent a lot of time taking very good care of her hair. Next slide. They had two children. This is 
Thomas Marshall, turns out to be Thomas Marshall Sr. Next slide. And his sister, Annie Oakley Gilbert. Both of the children named for other competitive shooters in the league that Tom Gilbert, or Fred Gilbert found himself uh, entering into around the world. And so both of his children were named namesakes of friends of his from other places. Next slide. This was our home over on the west side of the East Lake Road. Um, the Kleins lived here later on as renters, and after the father was disabled, Fred Gilbert, as a young boy, actually worked as a hired hand for the Kleins. That's how he met the daughter. He, they grew up, in a sense, together and married um, here. And it, it was said that Fred Gilbert's mouth was very dirty. He spoke in very, very clear and concise foul language. <laughs> and it was because his father had done that. His father was an early pioneer in this area and actually was a trapper, a mailman, uh, uh, a guide, and a variety of other things. And in his best period of time, he was revered, and you saw that he actually ran for public office before his, injury, his medical injury. So he had that kind of same tendency. His son picked it up. But the Klein family was quite religious. And it took a little while. But Fred Gilbert learned that maybe that wasn't an appropriate way to interact with the world and changed his ways, but it took a while. Next slide. <coughs> this is an image of the Indian shoot that occurred on the south shore of Spirit Lake. Uh, literally, my family's home sits right here and our boat's right in this area now. And these trees, a couple of these trees probably still exist, although they're at their end of their life. This is a postcard from 1911 illustrating, this is most likely a depiction of Fred Gilbert from a real photograph, but it was done in the line drawing. Excellent. And here's another angle of the same location looking back to the east. The boats are all from the Orleans Hotel. The Orleans Hotel sits back there in the trees. If you were able to see the individual in the middle, it's probably Fred Gilbert <coughs> shooting as well. Uh, not defined as that, but it's part of what was known as the Indian Shooters Program. And if, what, what's the Spirit Lake team been known for many, many years? The Spirit Lake Indians. Revered as a significant part of our heritage, collective heritage. Next. And another image of that beach. Next slide. And another look at the beach. It's always been an important part to me. And here's what it looks like today. Of course, lower water, but looking back to the east. And if you note some of those big cottonwoods, they still exist. And you can actually get down there and you can take old photographs and line the trees up with the, the existing trees with the old photographs from 1910, 1911. And basically know exactly where you're standing on that beach. It's pretty amazing. Excellent. So Fred himself became this enigma, really, for many people, because in, in, in 1895, he goes to Baltimore and he wins as a 29-year-old, basically at this point in his life, but continues on then working for the DuPont Company for about 30 years, from the time he's about 29 until he passes, well, 60, 61, he, he passes at 62, next slide. But he was one of the figures that actually was identified probably early on as a, a, a charismatic face, a successful boy from small town Iowa, who wasn't necessarily a professional to start with, just was successful because he was good. And the companies like Parker, eventually uh, he was a representative, or at least represented Parker, used him as part of their marketing. The, old, the Cabela strategies of identifying individuals, mm, hooking on to those individuals, and they didn't have TV. Fred Gilbert was one of those. Excellent. Another example. Who did it? Fred Gilbert. Next slide. Next slide. A real image of him holding a shotgun. I haven't had Gary actually take a look at that gun. He could tell us, I'm sure, what that particular shotgun is. Next slide. 
out with folks. I believe this is John Philip Sousa. One of the stories with Gilbert was that John Philip Sousa, the John Philip Sousa, wanted to learn how to shoot. And he picked Fred Gilbert as his mentor. And he actually had him train him on how to shoot. And in return, he had an interest, Fred Gilbert had an interest in the local community and doing a, a small band. And he was kept rhythm, but he couldn't do rhythm. He had a high eye coordination that was wonderful, but he couldn't do his rhythm. And finally, Sousa got so frustrated that he said, all right, here's the deal. He says, beat the drum twice and then spit and then beat it again. <laughs> and that's what he ended up doing. And apparently it worked. Next slide. 18, in 1915, there was a really uh, a significant period of time that they did a, a nationwide honoring of Fred Gilbert. That didn't happen with very many trap shooters, but the DuPont Company liked the way he had done things, and after 20 years with them in 1915, they put together the Fred Gilbert trap shoots, and they produced 500 of those trophies, and they offered any shooting club at that time who wanted to have a Fred Gilbert shoot on that particular day or series of days, uh, they would give them the trophy. And in the process of doing that and having to shoot, 1.2 million shells were shot on that day in his honor across the entire nation. Many in the Midwest, but across the entire nation. Next slide. He won a lot of stuff. And a lot of this is now in the Trap Shooting Hall of Fame. One of the things that's extremely significant about Gilbert is that he is a Trap Shooting Hall of Fame member from Spirit Lake, Iowa. And Spirit Lake, Iowa has three Trap Shooting Hall of Fame members. Also has Johnny John and Bob Allen, all in the Trap Shooting Hall of Fame, the only city in America to have three. And many of these trophies are actually either displayed or in archives at the Trap Shooting Hall of Fame. This is, you know, as a father, this is his son, John uh, Thomas Marshall Gilbert. I've been in communication with Fred Gilbert's great-grandson, Thomas Marshall Gilbert III, and this is his grandfather. This image actually is down in Arnold's Park, the Arnold Park City Hall, yes, Arnold's Park City Hall as part of a very large image that was taken of shooting that had occurred right there on the beach, most likely, on West Lake Okoboji. Excellent. A, a few examples, I'm not, not trying to read, just there are clippings like this that you can go through and you can put together entire books. Go ahead. Um, I, I highlight two names in here, H.G. Taylor and Hobart Clark. Next slide. Early days, they were caricaturizing Gilbert as kind of the centerpiece of this whole club. And if you were to look, H.G. Taylor and Hobart Clark are both listed here in this cartoon of the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was a centerpiece and used, probably commercially, to raise huge amounts of money by these corporations as well, just like today in some cases. But there's a lot of funny things in there. That's right. Next. This is evidence of the Schmelzer Cup, where he won the Schmelzer Cup. He was also working for Winchester, and it's the leader shell brass heads that you find on the beach at South Shores Group. Next slide. Gilbert Day, next slide. The, a cup, examples of places that held trophies, next slide. In Spear Lake, this is a July 1926, one year before Gilbert uh, passed, a shoot that was held here in Spear Lake in his, in his honor and, and to illustrate the number of people who were interested in trap shooting during that era. The transition at that point between black powder shooting and smokeless powder, the nitrocellulose based powders. A, an interesting time for those who were interested in all things related to firearms and the like. But can you imagine putting that many people together these days to go out and shoot in a, a trap competition? But 
in this community, we have one of two of the very best high school level trap shooting programs around. Been in effect for quite some time. Spirit Lake School District has, uh, Okoboji District has. They shoot west uh, out on the Little Sioux River and they shoot at the Isaac Walton. Really good clubs, a lot of people who are still participating in the kind of the specter of the three uh, Hall of Fame champions. A little bit of what he did. He won every challenge trophy in the world. He shot 30 live pitches straight, won the world championship. That was got him, got him going. Went into Europe and won a bunch of stuff in Europe. Uh, won the American Cups. And he won professional championships for years. At the age of 56, he broke almost 600 clay targets straight without missing one. And he was having physical problems at that point with high, high blood pressure. Shot more than a million shells. And can you imagine that? I mean, the pressure that that would take on your shoulders. Did they reload in those days? They didn't. Okay. That, not, not accurately. There were reloading capacities, but it was all single shells being reloaded. And so most of what these guys were doing, and I can't speak to all of it, would have been buying commercial shells preloaded by companies like um, Western, uh, Winchester, uh, <coughs> Next slide. Little story. Next slide. I, I, this, this is from Richard Dick uh, Baldwin's book. He wrote a chapter in a Trap Shooter Hall of Fame book about Gilbert. And I'm just showing you kind of the pages. His, uh, Richard Dick Baldwin's daughter, this book sells for $150 or $200 now, and we couldn't find a copy of it. But she sent me these images to use in presentations. Next one. Next one. And that's the letter from Annie Oakley on the right that can be read if one wants to spend the time. A very interesting letter. Next slide. In the eulogy, Gilbert passes in 27, August of 27. A.B. Funk is a good friend of his, grew up with him. He says, Fred Gilbert was dearly beloved throughout all of the years of his manhood by the people who knew him best. His large recognition and single achievement never in the least changed his attitude towards or his relationships with the home people. He lived simply, kindly, consistently, helpfully as a man of character and worth to his community. The uneducated pioneer boy became the cherished companion of men of culture and wide experience. Right here in Spirit. So that got it started because of that. Next slide. It's more than a city park. He won without bragging. He lost without grumbling. Fred Gilbert. Somebody's got to have it. <laughs> Sam, you've got a question. No questions from Sam. I, I appreciate you coming this evening. Sam, Sam actually provided me with, at one point, an entire box of old newspapers that I've been lovingly going through and reading from I don't know how long ago. Thank you, Sam. Oh, and I wanted to recognize some other folks. Uh, I wanted to make sure I recognized uh, the daughter of Richard Dick Baldwin, Donna Short, um, Gary Gordon, we've had introduced. Tom Marshall Gilbert III, who has helped me with a lot of this. Another descendant, Leslie Price, Mary Dreyer, Gordon Dreyer, her husband, and Merle Dodds. Merle Dodds provided me with some material here just recently that was really, really useful about hunting in this particular area. Gary, some quick <coughs> question? Yes. Well, I wondered if uh, Fred should have won a lot of guns when he was shooting competitions. They, they certainly give away a lot of them these days. Is there any indication of what happened to those? I, I don't know the, the ultimate uh, location for all of them at all. He did have a lot of firearms. What I heard from family, and I'm sure we'll, this is being live stream, I'm sure we'll get some additional feedback. 
but a lot of the firearms were gathered, had been gathered together, and at some point, the family had so many, and they had young kids, they wanted to dispose of them, so many of them either were sold or given to the Trap Shooting Hall of Fame. Some of them stayed, I'm sure, in the community and were dispersed. This particular one actually went out to a, a relative of Peter Neri um, and went into Florida and then came back when uh, the bicentennial was together. So I can't answer the question very well. Maybe Gary has at least a little bit of information about you know, what he's been doing here and how we might learn more. You can, come, you can come up here, yeah. I, I just want to thank the museum uh, directors, you know, Mary and John in particular, to let a total stranger come into the museum and handle what is probably one of the most significant artifacts um, I've ever been able to look at up close and personal. Um, to get to your question, uh, first of all, uh, there's great passion out there, as I'm sure you know, people who collect things. I happen to be a person with passion about, especially American-made double barrel shotguns. And I belong to the organizations where those people gather together. There's a lot of camaraderie, but there's also a great rivalry among those people. And the L.C. Smith people always take a jab at the Parker Brothers people <laughs> when they note that Fred Gilbert won a Parker shotgun using an L.C. <laughs> I hear that all the time, all the time. But uh, certainly, you know, one of the things about history, there's a lot of mystery. And for me, this is sort of the mystery at Spirit Lake, um, trying to find out as much detail as I could about that shotgun. And there are some things that we know about it now. We know what it's serial number. The serial number does have a record in the existing records, which are very sketchy, as you might imagine, uh, certainly from the uh, late 19th century. Uh, we have been able to confirm that it is the right grade. There's still some issues about the barrels. I will tell you, when I looked at the barrels, I brought uh, materials up to clean the barrels. I assumed that the barrels were fitted and in terrible shape after sitting, certainly locked away, but who knows what happened before that. Um, after running a rag through them one time, you would be blinded looking at a light through those barrels. So that got very well taken care of. Although you can tell it had been shot hard, as you might imagine someone who shot the volume of, of shells that he did. And one of the things, that an observation to, to add on to that was the the, looking at the checkering on the grip, it's clear that it was being held mostly by a person who was right-handed because the right-hand side of that, that wrist of that shotgun, the checkering is pretty much gone. The left-hand side's visible, though it was a right-hander and Fred Gilbert shot, shot right-handed. Now that's not real unusual, but it certainly is helping the confirmation that a right-hander shot that gun primarily. So we were tickled to death when we weighed the gun and then John showed me the record from 1895. 1895 that had the weight of the gun almost perfectly. Especially knowing that at the time, most other trap shooters shot a slightly lighter gun. And so this is yet another thing to add to a list of things to suggest this may well be the gun that he used to win that first competition. Was it a low serial number on that? Um, it's in the 39,000 uh, range. The L.C. Smith serial numbers are an enigma. Um, I have a gun that I know is an original L.C. Smith. When I query uh, the holder of the records, he came back with two other guns that had the same serial number, <laughs> none of which was mine. Um, so they, they started serial numbers and restarted serial numbers. Uh, so it's a really touch and go thing. But we do know that this number does exist in the records and it is attributed to a pigeon gun. 
And so we'll be digging a little bit further into that, into the mystery at Spirit Lake. And, and one of the things, Gary, that we're, we're really looking to do is from people who may be watching the live stream, from members of the audience, the conversations you may have with others, to continue to find additional information that the museum can aggregate for the purposes of helping keep the memory of and the facts about <coughs> Fred Gilbert and the life that Fred Gilbert lived and his family alive to the best of our ability so that others, maybe a generation from now, can come up here and tell another story similar with greater detail than what we've just been able to provide. It takes folks like you who know something, have something, are interested in something to help find things. Question? How do you get the name Dude? Okay, the name Dude, interestingly enough. So one of the, he was called Dude, D-O-O-D, and I found very clearly in the record that it was not D-U-D-E. It was D-O-O-D, and it was because as a kid, he was allowed to go into the groups of men, adult men, and shoot competitively and was involved in market hunting even as a youth. Father disabled, the father figures in the community looking to him and they wanted to kind of elevate him, I think, this is my assessment, elevate him to an equal and gave him a nickname. They call him the dude. And they didn't spell it D-U-D-E, they spelled it D-O-O-D because they wanted to be unique. And that's my assessment of what that's all about as I read through the literature. Good question. What about, Isaac. What about the two others that were in the Hall of Fame for trap shooting? I'm sorry? Who are the two others that are in the Hall of Fame for trap shooting from Spirit Lake? Johnny John. Johnny John uh, and Bob Allen, who Bob Allen still, his corporation still sells product. If you go into any sporting goods store, you'll find Bob Allen materials, part of the Bob Allen Corporation that still exists. How old were they? Uh, I don't know how old they were when they were inducted. Johnny John would have been a, a younger but a contemporary, late contemporary of Gilbert's. Uh, probably coming up as a youth, it's just when Gilbert's his daughter in law. I'm sorry? Johnny John's daughter in law. Okay, so you would know. <coughs> jo Johnny Jan went in the Hall of Fame 1976. 76. Gilbert was in in 69. What's up? Gilbert went in the first year they had a Hall of Fame. They, Annie Oakley and, and some of the best in the world all went, all in. went in then. <coughs> and Bob Allen came you know, much later, probably in the 80s or 90s, I think. I, I assume seeing the white flyer hat. Yeah. You've been involved in the gathering of white flyer targets? I've shot a few. Yeah. Not not a million. About, <laughs> about 400,000, though. I've, I've shot for 50 years. About 400,000. So, we, John, we have a very good example. Go John, this is Rick Kelso. Yeah, not, I lived across the street from Johnny Jan for one summer. And, you think there's any chance that Johnny learned from Fred Gilbert, probably? I mean, he was younger, but... I don't know. But what I do know is Fred Gilbert interacted with a lot of folks up on the isthmus between East Okaboji and Spear Lake, hunting waterfowl and hunting prairie chickens in the area around over on the west side of the lake. I know there were a lot of prairie chickens and a lot of waterfowl that died based on those interactions, right? And I would bet money that that was part of kind of the community interest emerging amongst a lot of people and a lot of families that now has translated into the continuation of interest in trap shooting in the local communities. And I hope it continues because it is a very honest and fun way to, to, to live your life. Four hundred thousand, my goodness. <laughs> you mentioned the Parker. <coughs> Did he use that a lot, or which, what was his favorite gun? Don't know for sure. Elsie Smith, in the very beginning, because it was loan, it was given to him, loaned to him, and he quickly then was, I suspect, attacked by corporations, all wanting him to be the guy fronting their products. Parker, as best we can figure, about 1899, 1900, 
somewhere in there really captured his focus. But he also shot Winchester pump shotguns, the old not Model 97, um, the, the up high grade versions of those. And there were others, I'm sure, that he shot. But you'll find the ads mostly for Parker and for the ammunition that he used in the process, is what I've been finding so far. Again, something that I keep seeking, and I'm sure we'll keep going into the files. My hope is, is that we take this program, and from some feedback that we'll get, we'll actually end up putting a narration to it, and end up recording it on a PowerPoint, and posting it to YouTube, uh, as something that Mary and the museum can use as an example of a project that we've worked together collaboratively on. And it certainly helps if those of you who are out there thinking, you know, I might have contact with so-and-so that knows something, or I have this little item that says Fred Gilbert or relates to Fred Gilbert, or Johnny John, or to Bob, uh, Bob Allen. Those are all things that I think we need to, as a community, continue to support because they all are significant figures in our community. You got nothing, Michael? Is that the Kingman House? No, it was not. It actually was a house that was similar to the Kingman House over by Arthur Heights. Oh. It's, it's, if you went to the Arthur Heights entrance and went south about a half a mile on the west side of the road, it's where it was, and I don't know what it was for. Thank you very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate it. Mary needs to take over the floor and do what Mary needs to do. Thank you, John. It's been so fun working with John as he's been diving deep into the life of Fred Gilbert. We've really appreciated all that you've done and how you've helped Fred come to life for the community, for the, co for the country, really. We expect that there will be more and more uh, opportunities to know more about Fred Gilbert. I'd like to um, tell you that we have some other things coming up at the museum. The next in our series of History Lives presentations will be done by Jonathan Reed. It'll be on October 28th, and we'll let Jonathan just say a couple words. I think looking here, everybody got a real charge out of seeing a lot of the old photographs back from the 1890s and so forth. I'm going to be giving a presentation on L.F. Williams, spelled with a Z, not an S at the end, who was the area's probably one of the best commercial photographers. And chances are, if you've seen any old photos where you think, gosh, is that the way Okoboji used to be? Williams took it. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, his life, how he got here, and uh, many of his photographs. Thank you, Jonathan. A couple other things that we have coming up at the museum is on every Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, uh, anybody who wants to is welcome to come for coffee and conversation here at the museum. We have the most fabulous conversations about anything having to do with Dickinson County. It's amazing where these conversations go. And you're always welcome to come. You can come and go as you please. We hope that you will choose to come. Also, next Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, I'll be doing a pastimes presentation at the Arnold's Park Library. The Arnold's Park Library and the Dickinson County Historical Society and Museum work together on these programs. The one next Thursday is going to be on fun at Arnold's Park. And knowing some of the people that come to the library presentations, um, there will be a lot of backstories about what ha has happened at Arnold's Park through the years. It should be really, really interesting. Before you leave, I would like you to visit the uh, display case right over there. Uh, could you, Mark, could you go stand by it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have kind of accumulated a lot of our Fred Gilbert items into that case. It's a temporary exhibit. We are going to be enhancing our Fred Gilbert exhibit as time goes on. Um, but this is just a, a start of it. Um, also, if you'd like to see Fred Gilbert's actual gun 
It is in the depot, the waiting room of the depot, and we'll, we've got some people who will show you how to get there. Um, I take a minute to just take a look at his gun also. So again, thank you for coming here. We'll turn off the lights, and you're welcome to wander around the museum as you choose. Thank you.